أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين إنه خير ناصر ومعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين My respected brothers, sisters in, in Islam and Iman سلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <clears throat> Once more we're thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most compassionate, the most merciful for giving us this opportunity to gather together as we complete what will inshallah be our third fast of the holy month of Ramadan. I want to begin once again by quoting a couple of ahadith from the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, regarding fasting in the month of Ramadan. Let's hear some advice from them directly about what we can do and how we can do it. So the first hadith that I'm quoting to you is from reported from Imam As-Sadiq alayhi salam and he says man tatayyaba bi tibin awwal an-nahar wa huwa sa'im lam yafqid aqlahu what that means is that somebody who puts on perfume somebody who puts on perfume at, at the beginning of the day um, while he or she is fasting um, that person will not lose his or her aql meaning that they will preserve, it will be a, a cause for them to preserve their intellect. Um, so what this tells us is that one of the recommended actions to do um, when fasting um, is to put perfume on ourselves. Now why is this the case? Uh, perhaps one of the reasons is because um, the Ahlul Bayt want to encourage us to make sure that we take care of our appearance. Um, this is a general thing that as believers, as Muslims, we're supposed to be concerned about how we look. That's one of the responsibilities we have towards our fellow believers and to all of humanity, actually. Um, particularly when we're fasting, perhaps it might be the case that you know, we're a little bit sloppy about the way we look because we're so concerned about um, the state of hunger that we have. And so we're just worrying about that. But the Ahlul Bayt emphasize things like putting on perfume, things like brushing our teeth and um, other such things to make ourselves look presentable. And of course, there's the spiritual benefits as well too, um, that some of them are not apparent to us as to the cause um, and the reason behind the putting on the perfume and then the spiritual benefits that are there as well. Um, of course, if this is practiced by our dear sisters, then um, they should keep in mind the rules regarding putting on perfume. If it's something that um, will be attracting the opposite sex, then they should do that um, only in the presence of uh, men who are mahram. Um, the second hadith is from, again from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, um, when he's talking about um, how to fast. So normally when we think about fasting, we know that we have to stay away from food and drink and some other things. But what he says um, to this companion um, in this particular hadith, he says, إِذَا sumta, When you fast, فَلْيَصُمْ سَمْعُكَ Then let your hearing also fast. وَبَصَرُكَ your, your eyes and your seeing. وَلِسَانُكَ and your tongue, walahmuka, and your flesh, wadamuka, and your blood, wajilduka, and your skin, washa'ruka, wabasharuka, and your hair, wala yakunu yawmu sawmika ka yawmi fitrik. And do not let your day of fasting be like the day when you are not fasting. So this talks about the deeper level of fastings. Um, a fasting where not only are we controlling 
um, a few things like what we eat and what we drink, but we're also lo- controlling the other organs of our body as well too, our other senses, making sure that we use these exactly the way that um, the one who gave them to us wanted us to use them. Please say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, um, in the second portion of the speech, we want to continue the discussion that we started yesterday, um, which was regarding uh, tips um, and strategies for um, helping our family life, how to build an Islamic family. Yesterday, we talked about the importance of having love in the family. And before I do a quick recap of what we talked about yesterday, I just want to let you know what we're going to talk about today, inshallah. Um, after the recap, we're going to talk about um, the main topic what we want to discuss is what happens if I'm in a relationship, I'm in a family where I don't feel love. How do I deal with that? Some strategies and, t- and tips regarding that. Um, and then, if, uh, inshallah, towards the end of the lecture, we'll end by looking at another ayah of the Quran and some of the um, commentary regarding that ayah. So just a recap about what we said yesterday. We said that love is something which is absolutely necessary in um, a family. And it's something which makes up the, um, the, the mortar behind the, you know, the, the, the institution that's being built here. We need bricks, we also need mortar, mortar that's pliant. And we said love is that pliant mortar that's there um, that helps um, in, in building the family. And it's something which is necessary um, for many different reasons. One of the places where it's very important is when difficulties come up in the family. When you have love, love can overcome a lot of things that just a purely business relationship cannot overcome. Sometimes you, you've noticed this. When you have some difficulty that comes up with your spouse um, or you see that in your parents, one of the ways that, to deal with that difficulty is by talking it out and reasoning it out and talking about, okay, what are the pros and the cons and discussing it at that level. But another way is just to deal with it with love. Let the hearts talk to each other. And that's a very powerful way of dealing with difficulties. Um, the love that we're talking about is not the love that you see in the movies and you see in soap operas. This is something that should be clear to us, but I just want to remind our brothers and sisters, especially those who aren't married yet. When Islam talks about love, it talks about the real thing. It's not talking about some type of exercise of of you know when, when two people's hormones are, are just going at overdrive and then they get together and then they have some sort of relationship. They fall in love. Now that type of love is something which um, goes away as quickly as it came. It's something which is good for movies and good for dramatization, but it's not something which is meant to last. Um, the type of love that we're talking about is something which is real. It's based on, its fundamentals are based on reason. And it comes with a sense of responsibility that now that I'm, I have this love towards my spouse, then um, I'm going to be responsible for them as well too. We're moving towards the same goal and we're going to be taking each other there together. Um, this is something which is very important that we understand that it it's has to be built up and it has to be um, increasing over time. One of the ways that we can test ourselves to see whether or not our relationship is going well or not is to ask ourselves, is our love increasing as the years go by? Because this is a sign of somebody who has iman, somebody who has faith, is that their love towards their spouses increases as the years go by. This is a very different love than the love that's described when people fall in love at a romantic and passionate level. Although romance and passion is something which is also good and embraced in Islam as well too, and that should be there between the husband and the wife. Now, um, one of the things we want to discuss right now is what happens when um, there's a relationship and one of the parties is not showing love to the other one. And you have a lack of love being displayed. So, before talking about what to do, I first want to talk about the philosophy behind that. How can we understand this? Why does this even happen? Sometimes people think that a good relationship is a relationship in which there are no problems at all. Um, and sometimes this happens with new couples. They start out and they have a beautiful you know, engagement period um, leading up to the time that they're going to get married. Of course, um, in Islamic sort of sense, Islamic engagement, Islamic marriage. Um, 
and they don't have any major problems that occur. They seem to get along. Everything is, you know, fine and dandy. And then after the honeymoon, go, honeymoon goes really well as well. And then after a couple of months, um, difficulties start to come up. Um, as if no, difficulties don't come up, then at least, you know, things are fine and rosy until children come into the picture. And then once children come in, then difficulties come up. Or in-laws come into the picture. Whatever it is, something or the other happens and they realize that, you know what, um, what we thought, uh, we thought we're going to be like sailing smooth the whole time, but now we have difficulties. So is that something which is abnormal? Actually, no. Um, having difficulties is something which is very normal. And we see even in the lives of the prophets, um, the lives of the great individuals, people who were the most purest of, of the human beings, they also had difficulties as well too, the prophets and the imams. They had difficult situations that came up, um, they arose and they had to deal with them. Because in many cases they were dealing with spouses who are not ma'asum. I'm not talking about the relationship of Imam Ali with Sayyidah Fatima, that's something else. I'm talking about other relationships when they were dealing with people who are not ma'asum, difficulties came up. So if difficulties came up for them, they're going to come up for us as well too. The other thing we need to understand is that difficulties are part of the life of a believer. As a believing individual, as a Muslim, part of my path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that I'm going to be faced with difficulties in life. And some of these difficulties are going to come up in my married life and my family life as well. So this is something that I need to expect. Now I want to mention that there's three things um, that difficulties, how, three points that we can take in, into account when dealing with difficulties. First of all, difficulties are meant to help us overcome our own imperfection. Number two is they're meant to help us grow. And number three is they are meant to help us, uh, they help to bring, they're meant to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I want to explain um, each one of these three before continuing the discussion. Please say salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. The first point I mentioned, one of the points I mentioned is that difficulties are meant to bring us closer to Allah. Now, um, how is that the case? What is it about a difficulty that comes up that makes me closer to Allah? Um, the point is that as a believer, I understand that everything that happens in this universe is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how I deal with this circumstance that comes up, this difficulty that comes up, is going to have consequences and those consequences are, are also determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when something happens to me that's difficult, I'm supposed to think about Allah. Um, this was the way that the Prophet used to deal with situations. Um, we're told in hadith that when, uh, this is from um, the sixth imam, he says that when something good would happen to the Prophet that would make him happy, he would say, Alhamdulillahi ala hadhihi ni'mah. All praise is due to Allah for this blessing. وَإِذَا وَرَدَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرٌ When something would come to him that would make him sad and grievous, he would say, Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. All praise is due to Allah for everything that happens. So in either case, his thoughts are on Allah because he understands that Allah is the creator of everything, including this particular difficulty that comes up. And he's looking positively towards Allah. He's saying, Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah for this difficulty as well. So, um, part of having a difficulty is it brings us closer to Allah. And again, this is reiterated in the words of Imam Ali. He says, Man sabara ala Allah wasala ilayh. Somebody who's patient for the sake of Allah, um, he's going to reach Allah. So, difficulties are a way of bringing us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, difficulties that come up in our marriage or family life are also a way of overcoming our own imperfections as well too. Um, they help us turn to ourselves. And we'll talk about this a little bit more a little bit later. Um, but they force me to reflect upon myself. What's wrong with me? Why is this difficult thing happening in my life? Because generally speaking, we're told that if we perform our duties to Allah, we're supposed to have a life which is fulfilling and satisfying and our difficulties are supposed to be minimized this they're going to be there but not supposed to be like totally uh, overwhelming and unsurmountable so whenever something comes up we should be asking ourselves what's wrong with us and that's going to help us grow um, we're told in 
a hadith that um, uh, a believer is tried by difficulty the same way that gold is tried and tested by fire. Um, you might be aware that gold is uh, one of the metals that comes naturally from the earth. When it comes, when they take it out, it's not pure. But one of the ways of purifying the gold is by exposing it to fire. And that's a way of making it more and more, refining it and making it pure. And the more it's exposed to fire, the purer the gold is going to become. So Imam Ali Islam in this hadith is saying that the same way that gold becomes pure when it's exposed to fire, the same way that we, are, we become more pure the more difficulties that we have. Imagine that there's somebody who doesn't have any difficulties in their family life. And it's just smooth sailing the whole time. Versus somebody who has these difficulties. The person who has these difficulties and is able to overcome them, for them, they're learning a lot more. They're learning how to deal with people who aren't doing the best of things, who have, aren't displaying the best of behavior, and they have to overcome that. They have to help teach each other what problems they have. And they have to suffer through that period while that person is working on themselves. So that person is growing a lot more and they're becoming a lot more perfect as a result of that experience. Um, so we said that a difficulty um, helps us overcome our own perfections, it helps us grow as individuals and it helps bring us closer to Allah. And so when something comes up um, in our family life and for example when we see that our spouse is not showing us the love that we would like them to show us, we shouldn't despair um, we should know that this is an opportunity for us to grow and for us to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, as far as strategies are concerned, what should we do um, if something like this happens? We're finding that in our relationship, I'm, I'm giving love, but I'm not getting the love that I want. Um, one of the first steps we can take in this situation and in any situation, any difficulty that comes up in our family life, is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to ask for His help. Um, this is something that sometimes we, we do as sort of a last resort. But for a believer, it should be their first resort. And somebody who does this will notice that when any type of negative thing happens in their life, if the first thing they do is they turn to Allah and they have Him in mind and they're pleading to Him and asking Him to resolve that situation, they'll find that that difficulty is a way for them to bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into their lives. For them to be in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, the whole day. Because that, when you have that sort of discomfort, that difficulty, it's something that weighs down on your heart. But if you can figure out how to associate that with the remembrance of Allah, then the same time you're feeling sad, the same time you're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And this is something which is very positive to feel the presence of Allah in our lives. Allah says in the Qur'an, in, um, I don't have the, the ayah, but the, the, He says in the Qur'an, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمَّمٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْبَأَسَاءِ وَالْدَرَّاءِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَدَرَّعُونَ He describes one of the patterns by which He operates in this world. He says that um, one of the things I do to human beings is that I test them. We, he says, we seize them with distress and stress. We cause them to feel a little bit of difficulty. Now what is the purpose of that difficulty? لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَضَرَّعُونَ So that they might entreat us, so that they plead to us, so they turn to us and ask us for help. The, what we're supposed to do when difficulties come up is we're supposed to turn to God, not turn away from Him. Not think that, okay, because... I'm not finding the love that I want in my relationship, that God is somehow has disowned me or He's turned away from me. No, He's asking us, in fact, to turn to Him. So this is the first step we need to take. The second step is we need to look to ourselves and see what's wrong in us. Now, this is opposite to the reaction we might first think that, okay, if somebody, if my spouse isn't showing me the love that I want, well, there's something wrong with them. I need to tell them something. I need to show them and you know, basically tell them off for not doing their side uh, of the, uh, holding up to the, 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 their side of the agreement. Um, actually, in the recommendation of the Quran in the Ahlul Bayt, we have to first look to ourselves when we have problems. 
Imam Ali al-Islam says in Khutbah al-Muttaqeen in Nahj al he says that one of the qualities of somebody who has taqwa is that when it comes to other people, they assume the best of them. But when it comes to ourselves, فَهُمْ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ مُتَّهِمُونَ That when it comes to ourselves, we should always be second-guessing ourselves. You know, after all, we know ourselves, right? We know that we're not perfect people. We know that we have a lot of faults. What is it that I've done to cause my spouse not to display that love that I would like them to display towards me. Now before I go on, I just want to you know, say here that this is the first strategy to take. This is not the only thing um, that we're going to say. So we shouldn't assume that whenever something is wrong, it's my fault. That's the first step we should take. But um, as we go along, we'll see that part of it also involves acknowledging that our spouse can also have problems. And we shouldn't get into the, to the trap and thinking that, okay, to blame ourselves for everything because that can be problematic as well too. We might be in a relationship where our spouse is abusing us. Our spouse isn't holding up to their side of the responsibilities. Um, and that's a problem. And we should acknowledge that. We might be doing our part, they're not doing that part. So that's part of the strategy as well too. But what I'm saying is the first step is to look to ourselves. So we're told in Quran that um, in Surah Nisa, verse 79, we say that one of the, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that one of the ways to deal with difficult situations that come up is to look to ourselves. He says, "Wama asabaka min sayyatin min nafsik." Any difficulty that comes your way is to the one of the things you can do is to say that it's from yourself. Like, what is it that you yourself have done to cause this thing um, to occur? And this is sometimes difficult. Um, you know, sometimes when people have problems and they see that the other party isn't doing the right thing, to blame ourselves is something which is difficult because you know, we don't want to hear that. We want to hear that the other party is wrong. And we, we're quick to point that out, quick to criticize them. But that's not the spirit of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. Um, so basically the, the message we're getting is that um, as a believer... Uh, when I see that something is wrong in my married life, I need to get busy. I need to think about ways that I can uh, make sure that my spouse has to show love to me. Now, one of the ways of doing that is by making sure that our spouse, um, my spouse has reason to want to love me. One of the ways of doing that is to make sure that we're showing them that we are there for them. That they can have absolute trust in us, no matter what. As long as they're not doing something which is against the commands of Allah, we're going to be there for them. This is one of the things that a husband and a wife want to find in each other. That no matter what, our spouse is there for them. If I'm facing a difficulty, then that should be the, it should be the case that my wife feels like it's her difficulty, and vice versa. Another thing we can do is to avoid those things that disturb them. Um, if I have a bad habit, okay, and I know my wife is annoyed by that bad, bad habit, but I continue to do that, then obviously um, it's going to be something which is going to annoy her and she's not going to be showing that love that um, I would be expecting. It's, some, it's, it's, it's a shame sometimes. We expect, but then we don't act in a way that we would um, be deserving of receiving. The last thing I want to mention today, inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow is that one of the strategies for um, increasing the love in, love, in our, in, in love that's displayed to us by our spouse is to actually show them more love. To show them more love as a way of getting love for them. Now this might be, contrary again, contrary to what we might want to do. We might think that, okay, if my spouse is showing me less love, then I need to respond by showing them less love as well too. They're not smiling at me. They're not giving me gifts. They're not telling me, I love you. Let me reciprocate by doing the same thing. Now, let's, uh, let's ask ourselves. Let's kind of play out that scenario. Suppose I do that. Okay, if I have children, what are they going to see? They're going to see that before my parents, at least one of them used to be smiling, used to like be laughing, used to show love. But now, my parents are like two cold strangers to each other. And they don't talk to each other. There's no love in my family life. Is that positive? What kind of effect is that going to have in our children? Okay, that's one thing to consider. Another thing to consider is that if I withdraw my love, then is that going to make me feel better? Right? 
truly, if we look at it, when we're not doing, it's, if we actually have affection for our spouse, we have love for our spouse, and we don't show that, we're going to be burning, and it's going to hurt us. So we're going to be hurting for two things. One, because they're not showing us their love, and number two, because we're not showing the love that we want to show, because it's part of the way that we're created. So it doesn't help to reciprocate the same way and by, by fighting fire with fire. But that's not the way that um, two spouses should interact with each other. Um, so one of the ways of, of actually getting that love is to show them more love. One of the, um, there was somebody, a, a non-Muslim who um, was, they say that he was looking for, um, please say salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. <clears throat> He, he was a soci- sociologist. He wanted to find a statement that would capture the, like in a single line, he wanted to say what, is the, what are the rights of people on one another? Like what is one statement that would sort of capture the essence of how we should treat other human beings? So he's looking and looking for you know, this particular statement and he found that statement in one of the statements of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa What is it that the Prophet says? It's reported that he said, "Ahbib lin nasi ma tuhibbu li nafsik." Love for others what you would love for yourself. Now, this is a simple thing, but it's one of those statements that's um, echoed again and again in the words of the Ahlul Bayt Don't treat each other the way that they're treating you, especially when it comes to believers, especially when it comes to our family members. Don't treat them the way they're treating you. Treat them the way that you want to be treated. So in this case here, if my spouse is not showing me the love that I want, do I react by withdrawing my love from them? No. I react by showing them the love that I want to receive. I, I love them in return. So inshallah we'll continue this discussion tomorrow. Just before I go on to the ayah of the Qur'an, I just wanted to again mention an example as a means of inspiration for us. This example comes to us from the lives of the Ahlul Bayt in particular the life of Imam Hussein a.s. Imam Hussein um, is an example for us in so many different ways and he's an inspiration for us in so many different ways. We talk a lot about the way that he was martyred and how he stood up for justice and that's a point of inspiration for us. But one of the other ways is in his married life, in the, way, in the relationship he had with his spouse. One of, you know, one of the, um, the figures who's, who's mentioned um, in the history of Karbala is his wife, the wife of Imam Hussain whose name was Rabab, or Rubab, depending on um, how you pronounce it. Um, Rabab was somebody who... Um, was a very special person. She was a lady of very high excellence. And she was the mother of um, Sakina or Sukaina, and the mother of um, the baby who is commonly known as Ali Askar, or also known as Abdullah. Now, she and Imam Hussein Islam had a very special relationship, a very close relationship, a relationship filled with love and affection with each other. How do we know this? Um, in history, there's been poetry that's been recorded, both from Imam Hussein and from his wife. And this poetry shows the depth of love that they had for one another. Now, before I read this poetry to you, I just want to point out that the fact that they would compose poetry in love of each other, that's quite something. Because normally, I mean, you know, you're going to sit down and compose poetry. Uh, it has to be for something that you care about, something that's important to you. And this is the poetry that's preserved for us. Maybe there was other things that they also composed in love of each other that didn't uh, reach us. So it's quite something that this is the way that um, they would demonstrate and show us their love and show the public their love as well. Um, one of the lines that's recorded from Imam Hussein a.s. He's reported to have said the following, لَعَمْرُكَ إِنَّنِي لَأُحِبُّ دَارًا تَكُونُ بِهَا سُكَيْنَةُ وَالرَّبَابُ أُحِبُّهُمَا وَأَبْذُلُ جُلَّ مَالِي وَلَيْسَ لِعَاتِبٍ عِنْدِي عِتَابُ He says that, I swear that 
Indeed, I love that home in which there is Sukaina or Sakina and Rabab or Rubab, that home in which my wife and my daughter are present. I love them and I would spend all of my wealth on them. Um, and there is no need for anybody to blame me for doing so. So this just you know, is an expression of the love that he had for his wife and his daughter. Now before I quote to you the uh, poetry from his wife, I just want to point out that in poetry, a, a poet has you know, the, a poetic license and they can exaggerate and that's something that's part of poetry. So let's not get the wrong impression here that it's okay for a husband to spend all of his wealth on his daughter and his, and his children. So sisters, don't, don't take this example of Imam Hussein and quote, quote it because of that. Um, no, this is just an expression, an exaggeration of just showing the extent to which he loved his wife and his daughter. Of course, husbands, yeah, it is good to spend on the family and to spend a little bit extra, but not everything and to not leave anything for yourself. Now, that's from the side of, the, of Imam Hussein a.s. What about from the side of Rabab? We see that she was somebody who, after Karbala, was totally dedicated towards commemorating what happened in Karbala. Um, despite her being a lady of great excellence, of great virtue, um, you know, there was men who wanted to, who proposed to her, who wanted to marry her after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But she refused to marry anybody because she had basically, um, her love was with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And um, there's two, at least two stanzas of poetry that I came across. Um, I just want to quote to you one of them. In this poetry, she's remembering Imam Hussain al and as part of this, she expresses the love that she had for him. It's a very beautiful line of poetry um, where she's talking about what happened in Karbala. She says, "Inna ladi kana nuran yustadau bihi, bi Karbala qatilu jazak ghairu madfuni." It's very beautiful. She says that indeed that one who used to be a light by which people would um, take their, their light, like he was a lantern by which the people used to take their light. That one who used to be a light now is in Karbala, in the lands of Karbala, but he has not been buried. Then she goes on to say, قَدْ كُنْتَ لِي جَبَلًا صَعَبًا أَلُوذُ بِهِ وَكُنْتَ تَصْحَبُنَا بِالرَّحِمِ وَالدِّينِ she says that, oh, Imam Hussein, you used to be for me a mountain, a solid mountain that I would take refuge in. Any problems that I had, I would turn to you. And you used to accompany us and be with us and used, used to display mercy and affection and the best of relig religiosity. Then she goes on to say, Man lil yatama wa man lil وَمَنْ يُغْنِي وَيَأْوِي إِلَيْهِ كُلُّ مِسْكِينِ She says that now who is left there for the orphans and who is left for the beggars and who is there who is going to enrich the poor and who are the, um, whom are the beggars going to turn to? Please say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Finally, brothers and sisters, I want to just mention again um, another verse from the Quran. Um, this verse is uh, Surah Baqarah, Surah number 2, verse number 200. And I would encourage brothers and sisters to um, try to follow along. Have a Quran with them or look on your smartphones. Um, follow along and look at the ayah as well. Um, I'm, this is yet another verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Himself. And he mentions something about himself and our relationship with him. Um, here he's talking about uh, what happens after somebody finishes the rites of pilgrimage, after they finish Hajj. Um, normally, uh, people, after they go through that intense period, they sit back and they relax because, after all, it's a grueling period. And it's a time when typically people, um, after being in intense remembrance of Allah, they sort of now go back to the way they used to be. And they say that in the old days, um, the Arabs of, of, in the Jahili period, after they would finish their rites of pilgrimage, because they used to have a pilgrimage even before Islam came, they would spend time just relaxing, and the way that they would amuse themselves 
is by remembering their forefathers. They would tell tales of what their grandfather did and what their forefathers did and they would compose poetry um, as such and that would be a way of trying to basically sh- brag about themselves. You know, say that, okay, my family did this, my tribe did this. And it would be a way of just kind of you know, passing the time and a way of entertaining themselves and a way of showing, them, showing off as well too to others. Allah SWT wants to combat this type of um, jahili tendency, jahili uh, uh, custom. And also for those who are living at all times, even beyond that, He wants to teach us how we should remember Him. So he says, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا When you finish your rites of pilgrimage, then remember Allah as you would remember your, for, your forefathers, but rather with a more ardent remembrance, a more passionate remembrance. Allah says that, okay, you know how you're remembering your forefathers? You know how you can remember your, your parents and your forefathers? At least, at least remember me in the same way. But rather remember me, you, the way you ought to remember me is even more passionately, more, with more intensity. So a question now, what is it the way, how is it that we remember our parents and our forefathers? Let me invite you to put yourself in a situation where you're separated from your parents. Either those of you whose parents have passed away, or those of you whose parents live in another city, um, it's easy for you to remember that. But those of you who are with your parents, imagine that you were to go away and for like a couple of weeks, to like, let's say you go to summer camp, and you're separated from your parents for a couple of weeks. Now, how is it that you remember your parents? It's something which is very natural. And it's something where... As you're going about your different activities, let's say you're at camp, you're playing sports, you're eating lunch, whatever, from time to time, the pangs of separation come to mind. And you remember your parents. Those of you whose parents live in a different city or, or they passed away, you know how this is. That without even trying, um, your parents come to mind. And the type of remember it's not just that you remember your parents. It's something that comes with emotion. It's something that comes with sentiment because um, it's your parents and they have a special place in our hearts. Now, question number two, how, why, why is it that um, our parents have a special remembrance? Why is it that it goes beyond just remembering anything else? And the answer is because of what our parents did for us. Our parents are very special for us. They've, everything that we have, um, we can in some way or the other um, attribute our parents to it. They were the ones who um, initially brought us into this world and they took care of us at the beginning. And they, in, in almost all cases, they taught us those fundamentals of what we needed to know. They were the ones who reared us. And so we owe a lot to them. And naturally speaking, we have a sense of a gratitude towards them because of that. So this is the way that we remember our parents. Now, Allah SWT says that at least remember me in the same way. At least. Now, question number three is, why should we remember Allah in at least the same way we remember our parents? Answer is because that everything that we've gotten, that we think we got from our parents, actually, Allah SWT was behind that. Allah was behind that and He was behind everything else as well too that we didn't get from our parents. Because every blessing that's come our way, any, any goodness that's ever come our way, whether it be from our parents, whether it be from our teachers, whether it be from friends, whether it be from um, the community that we come from, anything good, all of that, the origin of, of it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the cause of all causes. So our gratitude towards Him should be at least what it is towards our parents and rather it should be something even more and even greater. We just have to think about it. Sometimes we just need to pause and spend some time thinking about, okay, at this moment, how many blessings are being showered upon me? As I go about my various activities, as I, as I, um, whatever it is that we do, whether we go to school, whether we go to work, we're using our brain, we're using, we're, we're earning money, we're producing things, we're speaking, we're talking, we're operating in the operating room, we're engineering our projects, are making plans, doing business transactions, 
all of that is we're operating with the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our the type of remembrance we should have is even more intense when it comes to Allah. Now um, Allah concludes the ayah by giving us an example of two different types of people. It's very beautiful. He says that people are divided into two. There's some people who say, فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاءٍ He says, there are among the people who say, our Lord, give us in this world. But for such, there is no share in the hereafter. These are one group of people. And this is what they say. Now, um, when Allah says that this is what they say, He doesn't mean that they literally that they say this. Because there's no one who just says, Oh Allah, give me in this world with their tongues. But this is the way that they operate. This is their slogan. This is their motto in their lives. There are people who, like those people who just sit back and after their rites of pilgrimage, they just go back to their old selves. They just try to remember worldly things. They pride themselves on worldly things. Such people, when they operate with the world, they just operate on the basis of the give me principle. Meaning, give me, give me, and give me. Whatever I want, I want. And I want that. Okay? And for such people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there's no share in the hereafter. They go about their lives, and it's just a matter of trying to get as many material um, blessings and acquire material power and wealth and fame and fortune and, and lust as possible. But then other people, there's another group of people, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Among them there are those who say, Our Lord, give us good in this world and good in the hereafter and save us from the punishment of the fire. What, are, what is the pe- motto of these people? The motto of these people is, Oh Allah, give me, but give me hasana, give me goodness. Give me things which are righteous. Give me things which you have determined to be good and keep me away from those things which are bad. I don't want just everything in this world. I want those things which are good. And I also have an eye to the hereafter as well too. Those things that I get in this world, they're supposed to help me in the hereafter. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're always um, in the second group, those who strive for this world, but also have an eye to the hereafter as well too, and only go after those things which Allah has determined to be good. We, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us make our closest, closer to the Qur'an, and to help us in building strong families and strong communities. Please recite salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.